Good evening. Today is the 26th day of November 2015, and we continue with our series, Explorations in Savitry. And as always, I begin with Mother's Words on Savitry, and today I complete her talk to a sadak. In future sessions, <coughs> we will hear what Sri Arbindo has written to his disciples on Savitri. So Mother speaks to this young sadak, and she says, My child, every day you are going to read Savitri. Read properly, with the right attitude, concentrating a little before opening the pages, and trying to keep the mind as empty as possible, absolutely without a thought. The direct road is by the heart. I tell you, if you try to concentrate really with this aspiration, in a very short time, perhaps in a few days, what you cannot do normally, you can do with the help of Savitri. Try and you will see how different it is, how new. If you read with this attitude, with that, this something at the back of your consciousness, as though it were an offering to Sri Aurobindo, you know it is charged, fully charged with consciousness, as though Savitri were a being, a real guide, I tell you. Whoever wishing to practice yoga tries sincerely and feels the necessity for it, will be able to climb with the help of Savitri to the highest step of the ladder of yoga. You will be able to find the secret that Savitri represents, and this without the help of a guru. And he will be able to practice it anywhere. For him, Savitri alone will be the guide for all that he needs, you will find in Savitri, if he remains very quiet when before a difficulty, or when he does not know where to turn to go forward and how to overcome obstacles. For all these hesitations and these incertitudes which overwhelm us at every moment, he will have the necessary indications and the necessary concrete help if he remains very calm, open, if he aspires sincerely, always he will be as if led by the hand. If he has faith, the will to give himself and essential sincerity, he will reach the final goal. Indeed, Savitri is something concrete. Living it is all replete, packed with consciousness. It is the supreme knowledge above all human philosophies and religions. It is the spiritual path. It is yoga, tapasya, sadhana, everything in its single body. Savitri has an extraordinary power. It gives out vibrations for him who can receive them, the true vibrations of each stage of consciousness, it is incomparable. It is truth in its plenitude, the truth Sri Aurobindo brought down on the earth. My child, one must try to find the secret that Savitri represents, the prophetic message Sri Aurobindo reveals there for us. This is the work before you. It is hard but it is worth the trouble. Blessings, Mother. Today, as always, we have our dear Alok with us. And we begin <coughs> with a brief overview of Canto I, The World Stair, and then we move into Canto II, which is an extraordinary canto. Yes. <laughs> so uh, let us begin. We just had a couple of pages to go, and yes, I'll look. 
but I am still, you know, touched by this beautiful, what you read out, that the direct road is through the heart. Yes. And again and again we see this in Mother and Shirobindo's writings, that the heart has wings, read it with the heart, read it with faith, receive, open. <clears throat> but we reduce again and again everything to an intellectual philosophy. <laughs> so it's worth reminding ourselves again and again that Savitri, in fact, all of Sri writings and of course the mother's writings, they're not intellectual philosophies. Their birthplace is much high above. And the only way we can receive these revelations is by opening ourselves and making ourselves fit instruments and vessels to receive the downpouring. And one of the downpourings we read was last time, the, the whole origin of creation itself. And so beautifully, several key ideas, key truths. One is that the creation is conterminous with the creator. It's an extension of the creator, so to say. And therefore, it has no beginning and no end. It's not something separate and cut off from the creator. It's something which extends within his being. Its roots going down below into the inconscient and its apex climbing further, further, further into the superconscient light. The second thing which we read is that this world stair are grades and levels of consciousness which were created when the one plunged or leaned towards creation and plunged into the inconscient. And that is how the world stair has been created and they, it marks the steps and stages of the soul's return. So what is interesting about this is that before um, entering into the adventure of creation, the divine had already pre-planned our return back. <laughs> so <laughs> this is how he always works. Uh, this is his strategy. That if we find ourselves in a helpless situation, we should be sure that he has already worked the way out and through it. And we just have to find it. That's all. So as long as we look for a staircase outside, <laughs> it breaks halfway through. But there is an inner stair of evolution which has already been arranged, prefigured for the soul's return. The third which we read is that at first a base was laid and strange anomalous base, a void, a zero which held all within itself. And this is the matrix of creation. So the matrix itself is so fascinating. It is all and it is none, all both of them together. And then, of course, we read about the five elements. That's how they emerge. And these five elements begin to weave the warp and woof of creation and all the different forms, the different layers of consciousness. And these are, of course, subtle elements which also manifest as something gross. So one of the mistakes that very often we make is that um, not really in the Indian mind because Indian mind is uh, knows it that when we worship an external fire, there is a corresponding subtle fire and an inner fire and they are all one together. But sometimes we may be misled into believing that this fire and this earth and this water uh, and the gas is only about external forms. Now, the external figures are only representations of something more subtle. And that's what we read last time that uh, how the fire out of fire gas belched out and then uh, you know, it entered into a liquid state and then earth and then God's tread was heard and into its forms the divine child is born. So this is the play and um, a play in which uh, basically the divine and his Shakti are playing. He becomes the forms and she the force. Uh, the five elements emerge out of him and she is the one who animates them, leavens them to charge, creates different forms out of them and then again arranges the whole play, the circumstances and the events. So that is why it is known as the um, sacrifice of the Divine Mother. It's also the sacrifice of the Purusha because he consents to become these forms, this limited existence. But she is the one who actually helps this Purusha, one and infinite, to become finite. Otherwise it's not possible. And then she animates them, she fills them, she creates the processes she is the force. So she is the one who has gone far and deep and wide and hidden herself into the inconscient. 
So that is why Sri says that it is much more the sacrifice of the Divine Mother than the sacrifice of the Purusha. Because there is a whole Upanishad which speaks of creation as the sacrifice of the Purusha. And it's interesting that Sri spoke about it because uh, you see nothing that Mother and Sri have spoken is just for the sake of effect. Now he foresaw an age where this great spiritual truth of Purusha and Prakriti will be misunderstood and misrepresented in the mind of the race, particularly the Indian mind, which invariably gives to the Purusha a leaning edge as if he is someone superior. Mother speaks about it in one of her talks to the women. But the truth is, it's not the Purusha aspect, though they are one, Purusha and the Shakti. It is much more the Shakti. So he foresaw the age which is going to come. And uh, if one may use a more common word, he set the record straight and set the record right. <laughs> so it is the age of Shakti, <laughs> much more than the age of the Purusha. It was a bit difficult in the beginning when yes. mother was not yeah. respected. Yes, 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 absolutely. And this, uh, this mindset continued for a long time, mind you, uh, after 1951. Uh, 50 when Sri withdrew from the body, the mother actually at one point contemplated whether she should stay or she should go back because uh, of the attitude of certain people who would not accept her. And of course, um, there is a very funny aside to it. When Amrita came to know about it, he went to the mother and said, Mother, I believe uh, you are taking a ticket to France. Please buy two. And uh, for me, it should be non-returnable ticket. <laughs> of course, he said, I am going nowhere. And she gave the reason so beautiful. She said, because Sri Aurobindo is here. Yes. When people asked her to come to Auroville, she said, my child, how can I go? Sri Aurobindo is here. And of course, all her responsibilities with all the children. So this is her love. And it's the story of her love. So, so this, yes. yes, please. Yeah. You want to just a few lines and with lines, yes, and that's right. We'll go that's right. Then we go into the next yes. canto because the next canto is a very beautiful canto. Yes. Page one zero one. Is seer within who knows the ordered plan? Concealed behind our momentary steps. Inspires our ascent to viewless heights. As once the abysmal leap to earth and life. So there is, uh, of course, the outer seer whom we say that this person is a seer. Nowadays it's, of course, used as an epithet. But it's not an epithet. The seer is one to whom this inner secret is revealed. He is really a seer. He sees these levels of consciousness, the layers of consciousness can access to these heights. And he represents the original seer, the one seer, who is none else but the divine himself. And it is he who has, uh, you know, this, these steps are created within this being. And then this is something very beautiful. His call had reached the traveler in time. Ah, there it is. So, of course, his call is there in men and things. But, uh, you know, it takes time. It takes a long journey before we are ready to hear this call. Because we are so much drowned by all the noises, cluttered with sounds outside and within us. Yes. And then very powerful line, apart, in an unfathomed loneliness, he traveled in his mute and single strength. This is tapasya. Bearing the burden of the world's desire. So this clearly that Ashwapati journey which is being undertaken is a journey as a representative of the race now. He could have pierced into the supramental, but he renounces, he sacrifices, and now he carries the entire aspiration of humanity, its anguish, its cry, its desire for a greater word, a greater light. And he's carrying that. So that again, when he is face to face with the Divine Mother, there again we will see the same thing, that his heart had grown too wide. Yes. And so he asks. So this journey is not a journey where he is... Though he is alone, but he is carrying the entire consciousness of the world and its pain and its aspiration. And last three lines. A figure soul on nature's giant stare. 
he mounted towards an indiscernible end on the bare summit of created things so here ends canto 1 of book 2 canto 2 the kingdom of subtle matter is a very important canto for me uh, i've had the great blessing of entering that kingdom three times with Sri Aurobindo. Wow. And I can tell you that it is more real than this room and us in this room. And I have seen people who are dead and who are living. And I'll give you one instance, Purani, who had passed away, and Nolini walking with Sri Aurobindo in those great halls with great alabaster columns Today I can recall it more than I can remember this yes, carpet. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The kingdom of subtle And matter. it's a very, very beautiful kingdom. Yes. So, just behind our gross physical world, there is a subtle world. And at one place, the mother has also used the word true matter. And as we shall see when we proceed in this canto, that this crude outer matter is the result of the descent, the leap of the subtle physical into the inconscient. So it's more like a crust. It's like somebody who enters into, uh, plunges into a paint and that, that paint sticks all around. But that's not the real thing. So this hard rigid matter is basically contribution of the inconscient. But this is true matter, the beautiful matter. Canto to the kingdom of subtle matter. In the impalpable field of secret self, this little outer being's vast support, parted from vision by earth's solid fence, he came into a magic crystal air and found a life that lived not by the flesh. So this is uh, a common uh, difficulty with the scientist. Basically, it's an um, assumption that, you know, we say that things are living because they breathe and breath is same as living, but it's not true. There may be life without the action of breath because life can take many forms and this also, you know, when people talk about intelligent life elsewhere, life can organize itself in countless ways. Breathing is only one way that it organizes itself. At one place in uh, evening talk, Shurbindo says, uh, you know, you people will be shocked if I say watches have life. And indeed they have life. How they responded when Shurbindo uh, withdrew yes. from, from the physical world. You so, know that. Yeah. All the clocks stop. All the clocks stop. So there is a whole world out there which is a, a subtle world where, um, where there is life but a life which is not dependent on the processes of gross matter. So it exists independently. That's why when we withdraw from the physical body into another realm, uh, it doesn't depend even when people die, what we call as death as you were saying, uh, yet they continue to live in another plane, another domain. Yeah. And the mother at one place, you know, when you were describing your experience, I was remember remembering what mother has said in the agenda, that my child, um, we don't know life, we don't know death. There is a plane where the dead and the living mingle freely. Yes. And there are many dead who are much more alive. And then she adds, and there are many who are living, who are dead. And then she says, death to the soul, death to the spirit. Yes. So, you know, it's a different world altogether. A light that made visible immaterial things. So this is the other part that this substance of the subtle physical is self-luminous because the spirit has not yet plunged into the inconscient. So it is self-luminous. We need an artificial light to illumine ourselves. Though there is a light deep within, but it's very difficult for that light to 
expresses it itself through this opaque substance. That is the problem. I don't remember the whole quote, but Sri Aurobindo writes, uh, Our sense, by its incapacity, has invented darkness. Yes, 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 that is true. In so, truth, there is only light. Only light. A fine degree in wonders, hierarchy, the kingdom of subtle matters, fairy craft, outlined against a sky of vivid hues. Now, this is another interesting thing that there are many space-time continuum. For each world, there is a corresponding space-time continuum and that space can be actually experienced as a sky and these skies are of different hues. There are even suns and moons of different color. Yes. So, in different worlds, we'll experience a different space. The time will move differently and the... Um, of course, many things which we see on earth are also there. Earth is a representation and a residue. But there we will see them in different colors. Yes. Maybe an orange sun or purple sun, different kinds of sun and the moon. So Virgil uses uh, purple skies. Yes, purple skies. Even Shubhinda has yeah. used. Yes, and Sri Aurobindo skies. said, I have I've taken it from yes, Virgil's yes, idea. Yes. Under griefless yes, suns. suns. Yes, a purple yes. sky under griefless suns. Leaping out of a splendor trance and haze, the wizard revelation of its front. And then he describes the characteristic of yeah. this world. Now in all these kingdoms, we will see Shurabindu describes first an overview of the world, what it looks like, what is the experience like. Then he will describe to us the energy of these worlds. Then he will describe the speciality of this world. Why is it a different world than others? Then he'll describe the beings of this world, the godheads of this world, the highs of this world and the low of this world. So it's such a wonderful overview that really nothing is left unknown after and this. And the perfections and the flaws. Perfections and the flaws, yes, that also, particularly in this, he speaks about that. A world of lovelier forms lies near to ours. And the line that he's going to tell us next, reveal next, will shock our whole understanding of what is beauty and what is ugliness. A world of lovelier forms lies near to ours, where undisguised by earth's deforming sight. Look at it. All shapes are beautiful and all things true. Divine did not create anything ugly. Everything is beautiful. But our sight deforms it. It's a sight created under the pressure of the inconscient. The sense of the beautiful is not yet awake within us. So we classify things as ugly and things as beautiful. But this is just a play. This is not true. In truth, in the subtle physical, all forms are beautiful and all things are true. Because they are not deformed by earth sight. In that, lucent in that lucent ambience, mystically clear, the eyes were doors to a celestial sense. So senses originally, when the divine, the origin of senses in the super mind, from where all these, even the five elements have emerged. And all these senses were basically channels of delight. And in the transformed humanity, they will become channels of harmony and delight. But right now they are not. Because they have become very limited, gross, they can pick up some signals, cut out others, they can bear only up to a certain point, they cannot bear beyond it. And that is the problem that, uh, you know, we face. But here, eyes were doors to a celestial sense. Hearing was music and the touch a charm. So how... What is the experience in that world? How these senses undergo a change altogether? And the heart drew a deeper breath of power. There dwell earth nature's shining origins. So that is the real blueprint. Not this. This is a, as mother says, that when we look at this world of outer forms, we are inclined to believe that a practical joker came and spoiled the play. Of course, then she says, but yes, uh, you know, you can explain all this on the basis of inconscient etc 
She says, but all said and done, this should not have happened. She says that. <laughs> because everything, you know, suddenly becomes so distorted and that becomes so real to us. It's really a trapdoor. And then she says, why it has happened? Why in the original plan, the divine intended it for the greater perfection to emerge? The resistant had to be as great. That's why this plunge was needed. But then, you know, she is the divine mother. And she would have wished that everything just remains beautiful. <laughs> she wants that. The perfect plans on which she molds her works. This is another very interesting thing I have seen with sickness. You know, if, um, if you are unwell physically, even grossly unwell in the body, but in your subtle physical, you experience everything fine. Now, it is one of the signs that at least I used to almost prognosticate to myself, of course, not to the patient, that all is well and, you know, because this plan will impose itself back on the body. Because that's what it is. That's why when we are not well, if we go into a quietude, this original plan, which is undeformed, undefiled, will keep on impressing itself because this is the basis. This is the secret consciousness of the body. Even with pain. Even with pain. So here it is. They dwell earth nature's shining origins, the perfect plans on which she molds her works, the distant outcomes of a travailing force repose in a framework of established fate. So when things have come to the subtle physical, they are very, very close now to precipitate in the physical. So they are first formed in the subtle physical. And if somebody has an excess, I'm sure uh, many, many persons have experienced um, uh, in a dream state. They enter into the subtle physical and they foresee things which they can even... Uh, change if they are perceptive. Uh, Mother herself gave, I am sure many of us, I mean I have had such wonderful examples, uh, but uh, Mother gives a very interesting one where she says, there was this man who saw in a dream that uh, a boy comes and tells him that uh, I have come to fetch you. Uh, and then you know, he says, all right, let's go. So that was the dream. Uh, and then, yes, uh, I have come to fetch you and then he brings a coffin and he says, what, you know, he has come to, you know, it, it left a very weird taste in his mouth when he got up. So as he stepped out after getting ready next morning, uh, in the lift, he saw the same boy and he said, please step in. And suddenly the whole dream flashed past and he said, no, I am fine. I'll go by the stairs. And the lift crashed. So you see, Things are made ready in the subtle physical and then they precipitate. So established fate. Yeah. If they have come to that point, it's very difficult to change it unless, of course, you know, if one is very perceptive, or of course, divine intervention can change even in the gross physical. Attempted vainly now or one in vain, already were mapped and scheduled there the time and figure of her future sovereignties in the sumptuous lineaments traced by desire. So already the various desires, the wills that have gone have organized our fate. And look at it, we think, ah, I have won it. But it's already fixed there. Nalnita recounts a very interesting incidence. He says, you know how these tantrics work, they work at this level and begin to manipulate the physical events. So he speaks about a football match in which one of the teams had a tantric uh, who was helping this team. And he says how this tantric would have an effect that though the other team was much stronger, one after another the players started getting injured. They would, get, they would fall and they would injured and they would be out and eventually this team won. So you know there are so many um, truths which are hidden from our sight. And thank God they are hidden. Imagine what would mankind do if it knew how, how the subtle physical operates, what energies are there. In the sumptuous lineaments traced by desire, the golden issue of mind's labyrinth plots, 
the riches unfound or still uncaught by our lives, unsullied by the attainment of mortal thought, abide in that pellucid atmosphere. Our vague beginnings are overtaken there. What a marvelous line. Even before we begin, the beginning has begun. If one has to put it paradoxically. Our vague beginnings are overtaken there. And that pellucid atmosphere. Yes, yes. Beautiful, clear. Our middle terms cast out in prescient lines. Our finished ends anticipated live. So the beginning, the middle and the end, it's of course decided high above and it descends, descends, descends. In the subtle physical it begins to crystallize. It, the process of crystallization starts even earlier. From the higher mind onwards some kind of a crystallization starts. But in the subtle physical, it's almost like everything is arranged. The actors are actually in the green room, ready with their dress to enter the play. So it goes to that extent. So we can literally see that this determinism operates like this, that, you know, a play has been decided. So people are meeting and, you know, they are each given a role. Then slowly they start from their place. They go to uh, the place where the drama will be enacted. They are still in their original dress. And then they go to the changing room, they change, they have a makeup. And then they are all ready with the makeup and all the things. And the play is just about to begin and they start. So subtle physical is that point where they are just about to enter the earth scene. So everything is already prefigured. and But this prefiguring and this predestination is one of the difficulties of religion. Yes, yes. And um, it creates many challenges to thought. Yes. Do we have a role to play? Well, we have a role to play. It is we who created this to start with. So all our desires, thoughts have gone into this creation. We didn't even realize that when we were, you know, sitting idly and desiring and thinking and we thought it's nothing, it's just a thought. Casually, all these energies were picked up by the world energies. And the gods saw our soul's need and started weaving our fate, which will manifest much later, maybe when we have even forgotten that we ever thought and imagined. So that's how we are the artisans. That's one part. Second, any time the director and come and say, well, we change last minute changes. It's all right. <laughs> the player, the master player can always, you know, and nowadays we have a very nice word and I like it. That is something which corresponds to changing destiny. And the word is called improvisation. So everything you have decided. But the artist in his artist freedom last minute changes things. Yes. And it, it changes the whole thing, makes it very beautiful. So this, this aspect of improvisation I like, you know, means everything is not really fixed. Even at the last minute we have a choice. And the mother says that even when you are meeting with an accident, if just before that you make a choice, you may escape completely unhurt or with a scratch. So something big was, you know, going to happen, but it all takes place in a very gentle way. So there is a lot which uh, is in our hands. And of course, the greater determinism, the, the grace, which can completely cancel things. This brilliant roof of our descending plane, intercepting the free boon of heaven's air, admits small in rushes of a mighty breath. This is its task that, you know, heavens come pouring down with all its riches like a mighty Niagara falling all over. So something has to, uh, you know, limit it. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. So this is like a roof over the world and it uh, you know, prevents that lightning. And, and a physical example of that is that surrounding the earth, there are three layers of atmosphere. And we know how important they are. If this atmosphere is not there, the, the mighty outpouring of the sun will burn the earth away. Even a little gap that you know, we talk about the ozone layer and you know, it yeah, creates and havoc. And the holes. Yeah, it. holes. 
so you know this subtle physical what it does is it literally holds within itself all that beauty all that uh, mightiness and then allows a little bit to enter into the earth atmosphere and what does that look like shirobindo describes that imagine you know sunlight is pouring freely and then it enters into a plane or a phase where it scatters into brilliant luminous lines or threads so what it look like that shirobindo describes or frag fragrant circuits through gold lattices it shields our ceiling of terrestrial mind which will blow off otherwise yeah. so yeah. it shields our ceiling look how shirobindo describes that as the roof and this as the ceiling <laughs> from deathless suns and the streaming of god's rain because otherwise we won't be able to contain it so even this ignorance which has been created this hard shell prevents the seed from getting burned you know in every seed there is the core which is the real thing and there is an outer covering so that outer covering is very important because suddenly if it gets exposed to too much of light it will blow off so in our case the ego is the outer covering the shell the terrestrial mind which doesn't allow at all and this is the one which lets only that much enter which this earth can take for the moment yet canalizes a strange irised glow and bright dews drip from the immortal sky how beautiful and picturesque this is a passage for the pars that move our days occult behind this grosser nature's walls a gossamer marriage hall of mind with form is hidden by a tapestry of dreams so this is where it's the mind which molds the forms the action of the mind creates distinct forms otherwise it's formless the divine is formless but by the action of the mind forms are created which are distinct different and then the senses further limited into rigid lines and this is being you know revealed to us here so this all this happens in the subtle physical world where mind begins to act and gives it a shape and that shape will eventually impress itself upon the outer physical body which will be created heavens meanings and steal through it as through a veil heavens meanings steal through it as through a veil its inner sight sustains this outer scene and then he describes that it's a it's a world of beauty how beautifully a finer consciousness with happier lines it has a tact our touch cannot attain unless of course uh, one has done yoga then one awakens to these subtle senses and then one can feel things sense things which our normal senses cannot that's how some people have this prescience mother describes of this that you know snake round the corner suddenly she stops and tells everybody to stop and then she looks around the rock and indeed there is a cobra lying there so uh, when we awaken but equally we can dull these subtle senses become more and more crude and gross and then we get to know things only when they have frankly manifested themselves the people who can get to know of illnesses that they are coming even which part they are attacking simply because they are more awake in the subtle physical world so it has this part this touch a purity of sense we never feel its intercession with the eternal ray inspires our transient earth's brief lived attempts at beauty and the perfect shape of things because of this world we can dream of beauty beautiful forms even if we see nothing still because in this world every form is lovelier than the earth's so here is this world of beauty in rooms of the young divinity of par and early play of the eternal child 
the embodiments of his outwinging thoughts lived in a bright everlasting wonder stins and lull by whispers of that lucid air take dream you would rest like birds on timeless trees before they dive to float on earth times see what beautiful, beautiful lines, lines. Oh. this is how destiny operates from above downwards and all the beautiful thoughts inspired by heaven the higher states of consciousness the beautiful impulsions the beautiful feelings they rest on that plane until they are ready and then they enter into us and we suddenly are filled with hope with joy with new aspiration and we wonder how this has happened well they were all there waiting to take a plunge all that here seems has lovelier semblance there you know um, always um, i mean every picture of mother and shivinder is very beautiful but somehow i am specially fascinated to the mother's self portrait and the portrait of shivinder i have always felt that this is uh, you know a subtle physical form which she has of course drawn in in lines it's something very amazing if you look at the self portrait of the mother and of shivinder it is a very different kind of a feel it's almost like as if something which you know um, if you paint a picture if i have to use an analogy uh, if you have to paint a picture on water or if you have to draw a form in light how would you do it you know by a play of light you create a form so that's the impression i have every time i see that so beautiful yes whatever our hearts conceive our heads create some high original beauty for fitting dense exiled here consents to an earthly tinge so here that is the only problem that when it comes there is something which is added of the earth and that makes it dull makes it you know but our <laughs> heads create our heads create mind. that's right whatever is here of visible <coughs> charm and grace finds there its faultless and immortal lines all that is beautiful here is their divine so everything and last few lines because these are really very beautiful lines and they flow just about 10 lines figures are here figures are there undreamed by mortal mind there are some which mother has drawn also she has sketched one one of the in one of her paintings she has named it as forms in the subtle physical or a couple in the subtle physical so you know it's um, and of course she did all the sketches for hutus yes paintings. yes yes and in those sketches i find another force yes absolutely bodies that have no earthly counterpart traverse the inner eyes illumine trans and ravish the heart with their celestial tread so every time we uh, experience this subtle physical it's not just the sight it's not just the sounds but the heart itself experiences that joy that love which is there in that world persuading heaven to inhabit that wonder sphere the futures marvels wander in its gulfs things old and new are fashioned in those depths so as you said that that which has passed away out of sight things which were once and are not all that is fashioned there and found there a carnival of beauty crowds the heights in that magic kingdom of ideal sight look at you know these lines are amazing people who say that shurbindo did not know about world uh, and he was living in some you know lotus eating land when you read there are many lines where you see shurbindo knew much more about this world of humanity than anyone else look at these lines 
in that magic kingdom of ideal sight, because it's not deformed or distorted, in its antechambers of splendid privacy, matter and soul in conscious union meet, like lovers in a lonely secret place, in the clasp of a passion not yet unfortunate. I mean, these lines are magical. Yes. They are filled with touch of humor. Yes. And they reveal the human condition, how much aware he is about the human condition. And see how beautifully, you know, this this what uh, I think the message was also there on 24th November about uh, matter finding its own hidden reality and true meaning and purpose in the spirit. And the spirit finding its own fulfillment in matter. So this mingling of matter and spirit. And Shurabindo in Records of Yoga speaks about this experience. And this is the original Tantra, the meeting of matter and spirit, which is called as Purusha and Prakriti. There are different names. And the Ananda that comes out of that is something inexpressible. And the subtle physical is privy to that. Because there, matter is fully receptive to the spirit, the matter in the subtle physical world. And the spirit can freely play with matter there. So how beautiful he... he these lines are matter and soul in conscious union meet. Here also they meet, but matter is unconscious of the spirit's embrace. And even when people experience it, they doubt it. Oh, I felt very nice at the samadhi as if someone touched my head. And then they say, could it be? Is it possible? <laughs> and Shubhinda would tell Nirodha, if you start doubting these experiences, when they are just beginning to come in, how are you going to, you know, get the major revelations? Because matter is full of that, full of doubt. It can't believe there is grace. It must see something very tangible. Yeah. How can God come and touch and I don't see his hand? Yeah. Empirical. Empirical, <laughs> that's right. Others didn't experience it. And then you want to ask, doubt, confirm, but that's not the way. Here they are both conscious. Of course, the spirit is always conscious. It's conscious of the play. But matter is unconscious. But in the subtle physical, they meet consciously. So their union is conscious. And then like lovers in a lonely secret place, they love each other. Matter and spirit are in love with each other. Look at this suggestion, how beautifully. And we are taught, no, no, matter opposes the spirit. We are talking about this rigid matter because of the heavy load of inconscience. It's not matter which opposes. The mother says it's a very docile thing. It's because of the presence of the inconscience. That is the opposition. But matter is very docile. It is a very obedient uh, medium. So, like lovers in a lonely secret place, in the clasp of a passion, not yet unfortunate. The unfortunate part is when it plunges into the darkness. They join their strength and sweetness and delight. See how every line is so revelatory at various levels. Two beings can join their weakness and their sorrows and their pain. Two beings can join and unite their sweetness, their strength and their delight. What a difference there is. So in the subtle physical, how they meet, they join their strength and sweetness. What is the strength of matter? Solidity. Sweetness, concreteness, strength and its sweetness. There is something very sweet even about the earth, the smell, the touch of earth and delight. So, and of course there is a delight of the spirit which is so subtle. When it mingles with the delight of matter, what it would mean? And mingling make the high and low worlds one. 